Are you thankful to be in the house of the Lord tonight? How many knows that many of us could say, if it wasn't for the Lord, we, we don't know where we would be. But because of His mercy, because of His grace, we stand here tonight. And I'm thankful for the Lord, thankful for His presence. If you would, turn with me tonight to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Um, this is a message. Um, the Lord revisited me with. I preached it about four and a half years ago in Nicaragua on a missions trip, and the Lord just began to bring it to me in a new light. And I, I just want to say that I'm thankful for the Spirit of the Lord the last few weeks showing up in our services and showing up in our midst. I'm thankful for that. I'm grateful for that. I'm honored, as the psalmist said and asked the question, who, are, who am I, Lord? You are mindful of me. And, and we, we have to look at ourselves sometimes that we didn't deserve what love he gave. But I will tell you this, I'll gladly take his presence and that love that he gives. And I'm thankful for, for that presence that we felt the last few weeks. And I, I want it to continue. And I want to go deeper. I want to go further. Because it doesn't take long watching the news to figure out that the church needs to go deeper. We need to launch out into the deep. We need to get uh, alone with God. And I, I want to say one more thank you before I begin to read tonight. I want to thank the young people that came out. We had two uh, prayer meetings yesterday, one in the morning, one in the evening. And I want to thank you young people for coming out and being a part of that. It, uh, especially Tuesday night and Tuesday morning, just to see the young girls that came on Tuesday morning pray for one another, cry with one another. And on Tuesday night, um, uh, Sister Vonda said that she invaded us. Um, but they came over and we just had an awesome time in the Lord. And God is, is raising up this generation in a mighty way. But He's raising up not only a generation for today and tomorrow, but He's raising up His church now to be a brighter light than they've ever been before. Uh, but I'm going to dive into this portion of Scripture in Revelation 3. I'm going to begin in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Say, I know. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Say gross. Okay, I got a few of you. Say gross. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried by the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyesight, that thou mayest see. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, or be urgent, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me 
in my, own, in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let us bow our heads with, in prayer tonight. God, we come before you. We thank you for the worship. We thank you for the atmosphere that I still feel in this house. And God, I, I thank you for this word and its anointing and its power. And Lord, I, I pray that you would help me deliver what your spirit has birthed in, in me tonight. Speak to and through me. Let it be a clear message, an understandable and relatable message. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church says, Amen. Amen. So, many of us have, or, or many of us are somewhat familiar with this portion of Scripture. Uh, many theologians will say that the seven churches described in the second and third chapters of Revelation represent church ages. Many will say that, and many may disagree with that, but if we, we agreed with that fact that they are church ages, it wouldn't be a far reach to say that the Laodicean church is an accurate description of the American church. And, and I know this is nothing new to you, and, and I, I promise, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, it will get good. Turn to your other neighbor and say, neighbor, just give him some time. Okay, I got to set you up here a little bit. So, it, it, it's not a, a, a far stretch of the imagination to say that the Laodicean church is an accurate description of the church age that we live in right now. It's uh, very uh, lackadaisical, if you will. Jesus, these words are in red. Jesus is speaking through John here, and he's saying, you're not hot and you're not cold. I'd rather you be hot or cold, but since you're neither and you're lukewarm, I will spew you, or that word means vomit you, out of my mouth. Let me translate that even a little further. What God is saying is I can't stand it. I can't take it. I won't put up with it. Lukewarmness is not an option. But we find in the church as described in verse 17 here, that they say, I am rich and increased with goods. They think that, we, we, many of us think that, uh, that, that we have so much and, and there's no way that this or that could happen or this or that could come to pass. And, and he says here in verse 17 that they have need of nothing. They feel like they have need of nothing. And when you have need of nothing, that means you don't need faith. You don't need relationship. You don't have to rely on God for anything because you can go to the supermarket and pick it up. You can go to the doctor and get a drug for it. You can go to the dentist and get it fixed. It's convenience. We, we, we're increased with all these goods and conveniences. We have need of nothing is what this church said. But Jesus said, you don't even realize that you are wretched. Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We are in a church age where we don't live by faith, but we truly live by sight. Because everything is at the edge of our fingertips. We can look it up and find it and see it and buy it and purchase it. Listen to this preacher tonight. We find the church of Jesus Christ in this nation in spiritual poverty. He said, not only are you wretched, but you're poor. We have many people and come into the house of God and it's just like punching a time clock to heaven. And I think it'll all be all right as long as they got the membership. But they don't even realize that they're poor in spirit. And the church is poor in spirit to engage the issues in their life. But Jesus says to them in verse 18, 
I counsel or I advise thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and with white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. You see that word in the the Greek there for gold, it simply means coin. And you say, why, why is God saying, you know, I, I, want you, I, I advise you to buy of me coin or gold? You see, coin is money. It's currency. And what he's saying is, is I, I want you to buy into the currency of heaven. What is the currency of heaven. It's something that we have forsaken so often in the church, that, the church age that we live in, but the currency of heaven is faith. The currency of heaven is faith because Hebrews eleven six 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible. Catch that. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is not only pleasing God, but we, but we come to Christ through faith. We buy into the kingdom through salvation, through faith. We receive healing through faith. We receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit through faith. We get through the storms and the obstacles and the issues of this life by faith. He says, listen, I want you to buy into this gold, this coin, this currency that has been tried in the fire. Or refined is what that word means in its original language. He says, I want you to buy in to tested, proven, unmovable, unshakable faith. Because you think you don't, you don't have need for anything, but you don't realize that you're wretched, you're poor, you're, you're disgusting, you're naked, you're exposed. He's saying if you just have faith, tested and tried faith, things will begin to change. You see, faith, if faith is currency, it's something that we can take to the bank. And its worth is endless. Faith knows no limits, no bounds. But he says, not, not only buy in, not only have faith, but he says, no longer live in nakedness. He says, I want to put a white raiment, I want to put a heavenly garment on you. And, and what he was saying there is, you see, when we're naked, we're exposing our flesh. And he says, he says, listen, I, I'm sick of you walking around and proclaiming to be the church of the living God, but you walk around in your flesh. I want to put a heavenly garment upon you. I want to clothe you in white raiment. The, the Bible tells us this in Galatians 5 and 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The prodigal son in Luke 15 and 22, when he comes to his senses and he comes home to the father, the father asks quickly one of the first things, if not the first thing he asks for, it says, get him a robe. I don't want him to walk according to the natural. I want him to realize that he is an heir, he is still my son, that he is a child of the living God, that you are the children of the living God, and I want to clothe them with righteousness and purity and power. I want them to realize that they don't have to walk around in, in carnality, they don't have to be swayed by the lust of the flesh, but they can walk with supernatural power and anointing on their life. It says, buy in through faith, let me cover your nakedness. And just as God did for Adam and Eve in the garden, he's, he's trying to still clothe us. He's still trying to cover us. He still wants to show us that he's a father who loves us. God 
not only says, I'm, I, I, I wish you had faith and I want to clothe you. I wish you knew the thoughts I had for you. But he says, listen, I want you to anoint your eyes. God is desiring in this day and hour that we're living in to give us vision. To give us vision so that we can see what he sees. Because when we, we get on social media and we watch the news, we see what everybody else sees. It's chaos everywhere. But he says, no, I want you to see what I see. I see an opportunity. I see hurt and wounded people that need the gospel. I want you to see what I see. We know the story. We sang about it tonight. Elisha, the prophet, he, he's, he's up on the mountain and the Syrians are, are gathered around about him and he prays as he says, God, open up my servant's eyes so that he can see what you see, what I see. God is longing to instill vision back into his church. Faith. A royal garment, vision, Holy Ghost vision. You see, the Bible says that God calls those things that are not as though they were. That's vision. That's vision. In church, we have to see what everyone else refuses to see. That there's still hope in Christ. That there's still peace. That there's still joy. That there's still hope. But he goes on, and I'm just walking you through these verses really really quickly. Hang, hang, Hang tight with me. Be patient with me. He says in verse 19, he says, listen, I love you. But since I love you, I have to chasten you. I I have to rebuke you. I have to reprove and discipline you. I have to urge you to repent and turn. And this is where we are. This is where we are. Brother Brian, we know what it's like to have need of nothing. But in the last few months, we've realized that the conveniences of life can be taken away like that. People thought, oh, it never happened here. It's happening. So now faith is starting to come back into the house of God and they're saying, listen, we need to start buying into the kingdom of God and what his word says and and we we need to start stepping out in the anointing and and there's this big shifting beginning to take place and and they're saying, listen, I I, I want him to clothe me. I want want what God wants and there's a hunger and listen, I saw that last night and yesterday morning with these young people calling out to God, taking time out of their days. Many of them work and many of them are doing this and that and they have busy schedules and, and they decided to come in on a Tuesday morning and a Tuesday night and cry out for their nation, for their city, for revival, and for each other. Those were the four things they prayed about. They pleaded the blood of Jesus. They were realizing, listen, we, we've got to get a hunger. We've got to get a thirst back for the things of God. We have to start turning things around. And, and we all know what 2 Chronicles seven fourteen says, that if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, which means to turn back, to convert, to deliver from their li- wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Right now we're in that repentance. 
repentive stage where everybody's saying, listen, the focus is back on you, Jesus. I, I've realized I've chased worthless things. I, have, I realized that my focus wasn't where it should have been. And now we're in this repentive state. And, and, and I'll tell you that, that the church fully hasn't surrendered to it. But now with all the things coming out and we're hearing the prophetic voices like never before. And we're watching the news and we're seeing all these things come to pass. The church now has their ears up like a deer and saying, hey, there's something out there. There's something more to this. There's something going on. We need to turn around. We, we need to realize that we're being hunted. We have to realize that the enemy would love to destroy our voice, take us out, to get rid of us. But there is a church that is on their knees saying, God, you said, if, if I'm choosing to step out and say, God, I repent for my nation. I repent for my family. I repent for my city. But God, we just need you. We just want you. And there's a nation beginning to call out to the very throne room of God. And I believe it's touching the heart of God. And listen, we may not turn everything around. We may not turn the economic situation around. We may not turn this. this, this we might not sway an election. We may not do all these things. But I'll tell you this. If we pray and we seek God's face, he'll give us the power and the anointing to see souls saved and set free to see the drug addict delivered if we'll but continue to pray and stay in the altar and seek God and say listen I, I, your mercies are new every day God I need your mercy I need your grace I, I need your goodness I, I need your spirit I can't do this on my own God I want to witness to my co-worker I want to witness to my classmate I want to witness to the person I ride with God whatever it may be I'm available to you and there's a turning. There's a turning around. And now, in that turning, we come to verse 20. I'm going to need some helpers tonight. If I call your name, you can't say no, all right? Jaden, Elijah, I need you to help me. TJ, I need you to help me. Logan, I need you to help me. Whew. Pastor, that steak you cooked me is waiting on me. My pastor cooked me a steak, man. You feed a stray cat, they'll stay around. I'm still here. This cat ain't going nowhere. If I get steak at 10.45 at night, that's a good bedtime snack. All right. All right. Emma, I'm going to need you. Maddie, I'm going to need you. Come down here. You don't need to be up here. Okay. You know me, I like signs. I need you to take a sign and just stagger out in front here with your sign facing forward. You stand down there, TJ. See, I want them before you today because in verse 20, when repentance comes, listen, the enemy's not going to just let it happen. We talked about it a few Wednesdays ago, and I, I may sound like a broken record, but I'm sorry. This is just what the Lord gives me, and I have to preach what he gives me. But, but the enemy's not going to let repentance and that turning just happen. He refuses to let the church repent and get right with God because that's the breeding ground. We've said it a couple weeks ago. That's the breeding ground for revival. So when the repentance comes, in verse 19, he says, now repent. Say, repent with me. Repent. So now that the repentance is coming, he says this in verse 20. I stand at the door. And I knock. I'm standing at the door. And I'm knocking. I'm standing there, and, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Church, I want to tell you what God put in my spirit for this service tonight is that we're starting to hear the knock at the door. We're beginning to hear it before we see it. We're beginning to hear the sound of the abundance of rain. 
before we ever see the clouds come or the thunder roll. We're beginning to hear the sounds of awakening and revival. And it's Jesus knocking, saying, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm still here. I'm still waiting. I'm still willing. I'm still willing to pour out my spirit. I'm still willing to save your lost loved ones. I'm still willing to save your community. I'm still willing to touch your young people. I'm still willing. He's knocking, saying, I'm here. And he says, if anyone would hear me and get to the door, I will come in. It says, I will come in to him. He will come into us in a way that we've never known before. And he says, I will sup with him. What is sup? That means dinner. That means food. How many loves food? How many loves dinner? But what that means is that's fellowship. That's intimacy with God. And he says, I want you to know me in a way that you've never known me. But listen, somebody has to get to the door. Somebody has to get to the door. That word, open, when you break it down, I love to break down these words. Brother Steve, it can mean reversal. Not only an entrance, not only a a cavity in a wall, but it can mean reversal. And what lies on the other side of the wall will reverse everything that the enemy's been trying to do in our lives. It'll cause things to go backwards and you'll begin to take back what the enemy's taken from you. But we have to get to the door. There's fellowship. There's fellowship that's going to take us to places we've never been. But somebody has to get to the door. It all hinges on this. Verse 21. To him that overcometh to him that overcometh someone read that with me to him that overcometh to him that will overcometh I want to ask you this question if we want to get to that door Who in this house is going to overcome? Who in this house is going to become an overcomer? It all hinges. He's at the door. He's knocking. He's crying out. He says, if you hear my voice, not only if you hear my knocking, but if you hear my voice and you get to that door, I'll come into you, I'll sup with you, I'll fellowship with you, I'll have a relationship with you. But he says, to him that overcometh, what he's saying is there's going to be obstacles in the way to the door. There's going to be obstacles standing between you and what God's promised you. And I want to tell this to the body of Christ, there is major obstacles in the way of the church and revival. Revival's all the way over there. And the church is starting this turnaround. And they're starting to face towards Christ and towards the things of God. And they're saying, listen, I've got to get to the door. I hear that he's wanting to do something. I feel that he's wanting to do something. When I pray, I hear him speak. When I read, I just can't help but write because his word's coming alive to me. I know that God's wanting to do something. But he says, I have to overcome. Who's an overcomer in this house? Who's going to be the person that overcomes temptation and weariness and fear and lies and comparison? Who's going to be the person that says, listen, I'll get rid of my flesh. I'll crucify it. I'll lay it before you, Jesus. Who's the, where, where, where's the overcomer at? that will say, listen, I'm going to stop looking at everybody on Facebook and saying, man, I, maybe I should dress that way. Maybe I should be like that. Listen, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, he says, Jeremiah, I knew you before 
before you were even in your mother's womb. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Listen, honey, you don't have to be anyone else than who a God has ordained you to be. You don't have to look like anybody else. You don't have to preach, teach, pray like anybody else. Just be who God's ordained you to be. Stop comparing, stop comparing yourself to everyone around you. Get your eyes on the prize. It's revival. It's the door. We've got to overcome our flesh. We've got to overcome comparisons. We have to overcome temptation. Listen, young people, when that pops up on your computer screen or your iPhone, whatever you're looking at, say, listen, I'm submitting myself unto God. I'm resisting the devil and he must flee. I'm not going to put up with this in my life anymore. There's no mundane. There's no more ordinary. God, I'm putting away the phone if I have to. I'm putting it on airplane mode and I'm getting alone with you because temptation is not going to keep me from revival. Comparisons are not going to keep me away from revival. My flesh is not going to stand in the way of me in revival. Is there an overcomer in in the house tonight. Stop believing the fears and the lies. You know what fear is? It's false evidence appearing real. Half the stuff you're worried about is lies. Half the stuff you were over half the stuff you worry about. That statistics show 90% of what we worry about as adults in our lives, 90% never happens. But we'll stop at fear. Oh God, what if? What if? What if I pray and they don't get healed? But what if you pray and you break through and God breaks forth? What if you pray and they're set free from addiction? What if you pray and they get out of a wheelchair? Well, man, what if they don't? But what if they do? I'm not going to let the fear and the lies dictate to me any longer. Revival's at stake. Renewal's at stake. Restoration's at stake. I'm not putting up with it anymore. I'm going to be an overcomer. Who's going to overcome? Who's going to overcome? These young people, listen, I've I've listened to them pray. Seek the face of God yesterday. In this group you see before you. They're sick and tired of how it's always been. I heard this young man exhort last night when it was just us. He said, it's about unity. We're going to come together. We're going to bind together. We're going to fight together. You know why he said that? It's because the Lord had been speaking. He's beginning to hear. He's hearing something in the spirit realm. He's hearing a knocking, Elijah. He's hearing something that he's never heard before. Maddie's hearing something that she's never heard before. Logan's hearing something that he's never heard before. These young people are experiencing things in fellowship and intimacy with God that they never knew possible. And listen, mothers and fathers, I I applaud you. You've raised them, right? You've raised them in the house of God. But listen, this is something that you can't give them. This is something that they're experiencing that you can't experience for them. But they're pushing into it. They're pressing past all, all the lies and all the fears. They're pressing past all the comparisons. They're saying, listen, I'm sick of my flesh. I'm sick of fi- I'm sick and tired of falling into the same things over and over again. And they're saying, no more fears. No more temptation. No more comparisons. No more flesh. Because there's revival. These young people prayed for revival yesterday. But here's where it'll really get you. People will eventually get fed up spiritually. I've seen it over and over again. If they'll push and push, they'll get fed up with the fears and they'll overcome them. People will battle and battle and battle, but they keep submitting themselves unto God, submitting themselves to prayer, submitting themselves to time alone with God and in His Word. They'll overcome temptation. People, there's many people that'll say, listen, I'll be honest with you. 
I get on Facebook twice a month. I've heard ministers say that. I get on two days out of the entire month because I don't want to get lost in what so-and-so's doing and what such-and-such ministry's doing because I, I just want it to be me and Jesus. He didn't call me to be Pastor Ron Russell. Pastor Ron Russell's great. We're thankful for him. But that's not who I'm called to be. I'm not called to be Merle Abrams. I'm not called to be Tommy Bates. I'm not called to be Todd Hoskins. I'm called to be Jade Abrams. And listen, I, I just want to focus and I don't need the comparison. And, and, and people can overcome that. People can overcome their flesh they'll kill it spiritually but this is the one that I see pastor and this is just my perspective that the church struggles with most weariness they'll fight through the fear I've seen some of y'all you'll fight Elijah were you scared last Wednesday but he fought through it. TJ was probably nervous praying tonight. But he fought through it. Maddie was nervous about what to say. She said, I went through my notes. It was like 10, 15 minutes. It's not going to be any good. But God filled her mouth because she got over the fear. She got over the comparison. She's like, God, I'm just going to be who you've called me to be. She didn't listen to her flesh. She isolated herself. No more temptations. But listen, when you begin to go towards the things of God, when you take these things head on, they'll give you some blows. It's like facing Mike Tyson every time. It's spiritually speaking. It's like, man, I'm getting my butt whooped. You feel that way. That's weariness. That's weariness. That right there. And people, I know you're going strong, and I thank God for that. But what happens three months from now? And you're, you're in college, and you're back in school. And everybody else is around you. Because if you can't shake weariness, all this will come flooding back. Samson. The boy didn't have no fear. Didn't have none. Had plenty of temptation. But in his temptation, he grew weary with Delilah. He's like, woman, you will wear me out. I'm just paraphrasing. Because I guarantee you that's what he said. You were wearing me out. Husband's looking at me grinning right now. <laughs> you are wearing me out. What's the secret? How can I get at you? Sound like the enemy? Tell me. Is it your flesh, young people? No. Is it comparisons? No. Is it fear? Is it temptation? No. But by the time you get through all this, the weariness is just uh, sick of dealing with this. I hear him knocking. I just want to break through. I've heard about revival my whole life. I just want to see it. I've heard about healings my whole life. God, I, I want you to use me to do that. Can I just vent? I've felt this way. That's weariness. And he got weary with her. And he gave it all up. He was bringing his nation out. He was giving his nation revival by the, by the power of his hands, the power that God had placed on his life. But he grew weary with Delilah. And he gave it all up. Gave it all up because he got tired. By the way, he got tired. Crystal, he got tired. And he lost his eyes. Weariness will take your vision. Because you'll begin to look at all the things going on around you. 
instead of listening to where that knocking's coming from. Instead of going towards the door. He says, listen, if you, if you get to the door, I'm knocking. I'm waiting. But to him that overcomes. To him that overcomes temptation. To him that overcomes fear. To him that overcomes comparisons and flesh. But Samson grew weary and we find him bound. But the Bible tells us that in his weariness he wasn't done yet. And he began to pray. I could preach the fact that his hair began to grow back. I could preach that. Because he was put into remembrance of the call, of the knocking. And he began to pray, Sister Terry, and he began to pray this one more time. God, one more time. I've heard that you want to do great and mighty things. I'm tired, but God, let your Holy Spirit, that same fire that got me through the other four things, one more time, I'm so close, anoint me one more time, avenge me for my vision, for my eyes. God, I I don't want the enemy to, to take my vision any longer, one more time, pour it out one more time, let your spirit move upon me one more time. Let me press through in praise and worship one more time. It could be one more time away for the door to fly open, the reversal to begin to happen, revival begin to come forth, and your sons and daughters not only prophesy, but you, they begin to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. They begin to go to their schools and they begin to see revival. They go to their workplace and they're praying with people in the drive through You say, that is crazy. That's absurd. But listen, my God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask or think one more time I've got to get there I'm so close one more time God because if you'll break through he said I'll break forth if you break through Revival will come. Restoration will come. Renewal will come. I want revival. I don't want to just hear about it. Brandy, I don't, I, I, I don't want other people to talk. Oh, there's revival over here. There's revival over there. I want to hold it. I want it to be a part of my life. I, I want to be a participant. I want him to go with me everywhere I go. I want the Spirit of God to reign supreme in my life. When I hear him knocking, when I hear him calling, God, it doesn't matter. I'll fight through the weariness. I'll fight through the fears. It doesn't matter what I have to get through, but I've got to get a hold of you. I've got to get a hold of you. Why? Because revival is the only option. Church, it's the only option. I'm closing tonight. You can set your signs down. Thank you. Who will overcome? You've heard me say it before. My mom would explain this very simply. What does it mean to overcome? It means you get over it. I'm down in the dumps. Get over it. You don't have to be. I'm tired. Get over it. Church, we have to begin to call out to God as Samson did and say one more time. I've heard of the first great awakening. I've heard of the second great awakening. I've heard of the Welsh revival. I've heard of Azusa Street. I've 
heard of it all. I, I, I've watched the sermons from Brownsville in the 90s. I, but God, one more time. Anoint us. Restore us. Renew us. One more time. Listen, God is wanting to bring a generation out of the tomb that this world has put them in. Just like he did for Lazarus. And he wants to take them. You see, in John chapter 11, he's in the tomb. But in John chapter 12, Pastor, he's at the table. Because somebody got to the door. You realize what could release a generation? Is somebody just rolling away the stone. You've heard me say it before. Jesus could have said the word and the stone been blown up into pieces. And said, Lazarus, come forth. But he had one request of the people that were standing there. Move the stone. Get to the door. Remove it. Because I want to call something forth. The thing that you've been dealing with, he says, I'm about to call you out of it. The battle that you've been fighting, I want to call you out of it. But to him that overcometh. They'll come to the music tonight. Who will overcome? Young people, who will it be? It could be every single one of you. But you have to ask yourself, God, willing am I willing am I ready who will overcome let me put it to you this way young people I want you to really catch this 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 overcoming statement that this this title is all throughout the scriptures from beginning to end but it, it sounded a little different than just who will overcome. It sounds like this. Who will deliver us from the hand of Pharaoh? Who? Who will lead us into the promises of God? Who will deliver us from the Midianite raiders that come and they steal at the time of harvest. They take what we've sown and we, we fought for and we've bled for and we've worked for. It sounds like this. Who will face Goliath? down from heaven who will put an end to the drought who will prophesy to the dry bones and watch them come alive who who will overcome who will go before the king who will build the house of the Lord who will build the altar who will cry out to the Lord on our behalf? Who will deliver us from the fire and from the furnace? Who? God asked this question to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 6. He said, whom shall I send? 
who will go for us. I can just see Isaiah, maybe this is just how God speaks to me, sobbing, pounding his chest, said, I'll go. I'll go. In Jeremiah's day, who will speak the word of the Lord? And he said, oh, not me. But then he says, but it was like fire. Shut up in my bones. Who will overcome? Who will go into an upper room and seek God until they're endued with power from on high? Who will press until it happens? Who will pray until they see it come to pass? Who? I believe there's some young people and there's some adults in this house. Say, I will. And it's the tale of two who's. God asking, who? But then when the anointing comes upon you like it did David, David asked Goliath, or he asked, he asked the, the Israelite soldiers around him about Goliath, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this overgrown, overfed fat boy? I am sick and tired because that's what it takes that's what overcoming is you get sick of dealing with it and you get over it he said I am sick and tired I will not listen to a minute more of this world desecrating my God I will not take another moment of them saying that the church is dead and forgotten I will not listen to another person say listen I came to the house of God I had a need and I didn't get it healed I didn't get it met that is over because when God says who I will God I will I'll fight I'll stand between the pillars I'll press I'll pray I'll read whatever it takes stand with me across this house who because you never have to do it alone like the old song used to say give up and let Jesus take over give up and let Jesus take over because listen Now's the time. I know I'm taking too long. Maddie talked about shoes last week. She said, now's the time. We've got to step in. Now, 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 now. It can't be a futuristic thing. It's got to be now. But who? Who will get sick of dealing with the same old temptation day? I'm, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired I'm sick and tired of being weary because my Bible tells me that if I'm not weary and well doing that I'll reap if I faint not but who whom shall I send who will go for Here am I. Send me. Just remember that if God be for us, who can be against us? No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors 
through Jesus Christ. Remember these things. Remember these things. That Jesus has overcome the world. That he's overcome everything that was represented here tonight. He's done it. He's done it. Never forget. Because of the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony, you can overcome. To him that overcometh. If you plead the blood of Jesus Christ, Testify of his goodness and his grace. My Bible tells me you're an overcomer. It's that simple. I'll leave you with one verse. Because I've spoken my heart. And it's what Jesus ended this chapter with. He that hath an ear. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. It says, if any man will hear my voice, he that hath an ear, let him hear. What he's saying is the Spirit is speaking. Will you respond? door, if opened, is revival, reversal, and restoration. But it has to be opened. We've got a breakthrough. I know I do this from time to time. I'm going to ask our young people to come forward. 18 and younger children as well, 18 and younger, I want you to come forward. Who will overcome? This generation will. I believe that. Terry, I believe that. Who will overcome? This generation will. Because I saw it last night. I saw it yesterday morning. Who will overcome this generation? Will. Talking to some of these young men, some of these young ladies, the consensus is, I don't want normal church anymore. Across the board, Brother Steve, that's what they're all saying. I don't want normal. And I don't know if you've seen it the way I've seen it. But they're not be they're not worshiping like normal anymore. They're, st- they're being stretched. They're raising their hands. They're crying out to God. They're opening service. They're leading service. That tells me this generation will overcome. Parents. Every, every adult in this house, if you have a kid up here, if you don't have a kid up here, come. Gather behind them. You guys just shift this way a little bit. Shift this way a little bit. And we're going to pray for you. Because Jesus said this to Peter. He says, Simon, Satan desires to have you and to sift you like wheat. But he spoke to him, Elijah, and he said this. He said, but Peter, grab grab my hand. But I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. What Jesus was telling him is the enemy desires you. But I told him that he can't have you. If you want a simple translation, that's what it was. Satan desired you. But I told him, Jaden, I told him he couldn't have you. I told him, KK, that he couldn't have you. I've prayed for you. And I told him he couldn't have you. 
He can't have this generation. He can't have your children. He can't have your grandchildren. He can't have your sons and daughters, period. He can't have this ministry. He can't have the church of Jesus Christ because it's been bought with a price. And we're just going to pray. We're going to pray that God would give you such an unction and such a a renewal in your spirit. I, I pray that the Holy Ghost of God comes upon you. If you're not filled, that you would be filled. And that you would press into the things of God, regardless of what the enemy's doing. Press in and get to that door. That's what I want to pray for them tonight. That they'll be the generation. That they'll be the youth group. Not just because they're our youth group and, and they're my favorite people. I mean, that may have a little bit to do with it. But I believe it. Nobody else in Connorsville wants to do it but them. Because they're able, because they're God's able. So we're going to pray for them. And Pastor, I would really appreciate your help to just go down and pray for each and every child, each and every teenager, each and every young man and young woman. And we're going to speak the Holy Ghost in power and fire. Hebrews says it like this, for our God is a consuming fire. That's what I want for your life. That you can't help but be godly. That you can't help but be holy. That you can't help but be righteous because he's consuming every part of you. That's what I want. We're going to pray. Begin to pray right now. Begin to pray right now.